opportunities throughout the country. Lloyd Russell Moore. Thank you very much. The, the Government and the Chancellor today spoke after, of course, the Shadow Chancellor, and he complained that we were um, producing an unreconstructed list of misery. He complained that we weren't jolly enough about how fantastic he thought the economy was. Well, I ask him maybe to go and speak to the Weatherspoons workers who are on casual contracts and one who had to live in a tent because he couldn't afford his rent. I ask him to go and speak to them and say whether we are being too miserable or whether it's the government looking through rose-tinted glasses of jobs and the economy. And of course it wasn't the government that helped those workers, it was the Bakers Union that organised and struck for 24 hours forcing a better payment from the Weatherspoons management. And that is, of course, constantly what produces better jobs and work conditions in this country. It is union action time and time again. Ask, of course, the families who, week in and week out, have to use the food bank in Whitehawk, one of the estates in my constituency. And despite them being in full-time work, are not able to put food on the table of their children. And a rebranding exercise that this government did, calling the minimum wage now the living wage, hasn't helped improve the lives of my constituents. What has improved the lives of, their cons of our, our, my constituents is businesses, the council and trade unions working together to introduce a real living wage in Brighton. Collective action is what has improved their their life standards and where workplaces have refused, they continue to be paid poverty pay. Of course, pa tell the classroom assistants in Morscombe Primary School last year that were made redundant because the government has cut money to our schools. Tell them that the job market is rosy and everything is fine and we are being too miserable because I tell you they will say that our version of reality is what they experience day to day and the fantasy figures and the fantasy rose tinted nature of the government's view is not based in reality. Exactly. Tell it to the academics that this year have had to go on strike numerous days, the longest strike of UCU in its history, because young academics are paid on casual contracts just when they are marking their papers. They are not well paid professors. They, many of them, are struggling to meet. They can't get mortgages. They can't pay rent or put down deposits. And it is this government's underfunding of the university university sector and our public services that have forced this. So tell them that there is a problem. Tell them that there is no problem and they will laugh in your face. Look, we've had an election and unfortunately we lost. But what... But that does not mean that the government have won the economic argument because the economic argument shows that this country is that no I'm not because we've got to move on shortly that this country is stagnating and it shows that jobs do not pay to live it is a disgrace in this country the richest in one of the richest in the world and we need to change that and the only thing that will change that is trade union action is decent local government and is a Labour government. Richard Fuller. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, in, in marked contrast to the honourable gentleman who have just spoken, perhaps I can start a little quieter uh, by saying a, a few words on behalf of my predecessor as Member of Parliament for North East Bedfordshire, Alistair Burt, yeah. who served the constituencies of Bury North and North East Bedfordshire uh, for the period from 1983 until standing down the last election with a very short break uh, between 1997 and 2001. Uh, I got to know Alistair in 1984, and on almost every political issue, uh, he and I often found ourselves in accordance with the great exception of our views on the membership of the European Union. Well, also on football. 
Uh, Alistair loves it, uh, me not so much. Uh, but Alistair, in addition to being well respected across his house, uh, also uh, had great knowledge and understanding of the Middle East, an issue which he continues uh, to pursue, and had that unique ability to be trusted uh, on all uh, sides. Uh, now, Mr. Speaker, I should just point, as the Register of Interest hasn't been yet published, uh, just point to honourable members, given some things I might say, uh, that I'm a director of uh, software companies. Uh, Mr. Speaker, a new dawn uh, beckons and a new government uh, is formed to set the initial course for our country, a course to shape the success uh, or failure of our refound independence. The most likely error this government will make will be to underestimate the scale of the opportunity for change, that this government will prefer the comforts of the known rather than the uncertainties of the unknown, that the voices of well-connected incumbents will drown out those of precocious challenges. This is not a time for a government to take timid steps, but to take giant strides. Every ounce of radicalism which is lost today will be repaid in pounds of future regret for opportunities lost. Our country needs this government to argue with that fierce urgency of now that President Obama summoned America to embrace a decade ago. And I would like to outline three areas from the Queen's speech where I believe that radicalism can take place. For decades, competitive capitalism has driven enormous gains in human progress. But the case for capitalism also now appears tarnished from the consequences of globalisation, from regulatory capture and from repeated examples of corporate excess. This home of Smith, of Locke, of Ricardo is best placed to remake the global case for capitalism for a new century as we define our new role in the world. At the heart of this case, we must place the entrepreneurs, the small businesses, the start-ups and the innovators. The government should also review the primacy of shareholder value as the sole mission for our companies. We should simplify the governance code, yes, but also give oversight more clout so excesses are more effectively curtailed and so companies are more accountable for the externalities of their actions. We need measures to weaken the grip of crony capitalism, dysfunctional privatisations, public contracts repeatedly handed to the same as before conglomerates as the only game in town, disallowing the socialisation of losses from private risk-taking, and yes, reviewing our corporate tax breaks. As we leave the EU, we should not inadvertently leave out the welcome mat encouraging lobbyists to decamp from Brussels to Westminster or, for that matter, York. We need measures to provide people with swifter redress and greater protection from business and regulatory failure. For example, in my own area, the simplest thing of a local plan not being accepted, you get creepy private developers trying to put in developments in that short space of time between plans. Constituents of mine in Willington, in Harold, in Ravenston and Potton, having to deal with a lifetime change just from one small bureaucratic failure. And the UK should make free markets and free trade hallmarks of our foreign policy. I see the Prime Minister is back from his UK Africa Investment Summit, and that was precisely the place he should be today. And I urge him to place a trade deal with Africa at the core of our new relationship, one that casts off the protectionism of the EU and that reasserts the value of free trade over development aid. Yep. An imperative for government action, an urgent imperative, is for reform of markets based on the utilisation of data and, more specifically, the actions of digital platforms. The evidence of externalities in these markets is compelling. The undermining of local <coughs> accountability uh, through the impact on local newspapers the unquantified but evident impact on mental health and well-being, and the unequalled political leverage dispensed 
by the machine learning models remote from inspection or democratic insight. These only hint at the scale of the pot potential distortion of competitive capitalism, a distortion in which we are willing, gullible participants. The extraction of our data from our actions and of our preferences to enable predictive analysis to be sold for profit make British citizens in this century the equivalent of those exploited by colonial powers in earlier centuries. These new colonists, these casual exploiters of our future tents, require intelligent, more demanding regulation. We need accountability in our infrastructure. Recent announcements by my right hon. Friend, the Chancellor, indicate that he understands the necessity for radicalism. His proposed infrastructure fund, his commitment to changing investment algorithms to give the regions a fighting chance, and his declaration that no industry should expect the state to relegate the national interest to their private interests in our trade negotiations with the EU. May I encourage him further with three thoughts? First of all, Mr. Speaker, he should maintain fiscal discipline and not use the current experience of low interest rates as a windfall, but rather as a way for reshaping public pensions. Secondly, he should create compelling tax incentives that support local community investing in local free trade zones. And finally, he needs an early cross-departmental example of an infrastructure bid that makes sense. And I have an oven-ready deal. <laughs> North East Bedfordshire is already shouldering a substantial amount of the nation's need for housing. We already see across the constituency shortages of public services like GPs. We await very shortly announcements on East West Rail. We have a long standing need for the realignment of the A1, which will be a benefit not only for constituents of mine, but also for those in the Midlands, as we heard earlier in the debate. I say, Mr. Speaker, that this is the deal. This is the example that my right hon. Friend, the Chief Secretary, I am sure in his speech will want to point to as precisely what we need as this Government embarks on the next stage in our country's great future. Yeah. Yeah.